I think you can take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 76th session of Virtual Shadowing. Today's session is a specialty spotlight in physical medicine and rehabilitation with Dr. Siddharth Umapathy. As always, you can reach out to us on Instagram at Virtual Shadowing or through our Gmail, which is virtualshadowing at gmail.com. These sessions will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, which is Free Health Virtual Shadowing. Next slide, please. Here are some of our upcoming sessions. So next week, we have virtual shadowing simulations. The week after that, we have surviving health science training. On the 23rd, we have specialty spotlight psychiatry. And after that, we'll have a specialty spotlight in family medicine. Join us on Zoom or YouTube Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time for these topics. Next slide, please. Here's the virtual shadowing working group comprised of Reagan, Shayan, Taylor, Ali, Rachel, Miriam, Elena, Anirus, Kiana, Aditya, and myself, as well as our four physician providers, Dr. Raymond Fowler, Dr. Brandon Morchetti, Dr. Gilba Gilberto Salazar, and Dr. Elaine Rio. Next slide, please. As usual, we'll have two Q&A sessions, one near the middle of the presentation and one at the very end. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat as we go along. Don't direct message them to either me or Dr. Sid because we might not see them. And this session will last for about an hour and a half to two hours. And now for a few words from Dr. Fowler. Well, welcome everybody. It's so good to have you. When we started this program over a year and a half ago, we never dreamed that we would have now 76 lectures online. This is the middle of the admissions committee season and we are seeing many applicants who are putting virtual shadowing hours into their applications. And we are really treating, I would say on the committee, we're really treating those hours as shadowing hours, some virtual, some in person. And so we really welcome you back. We, uh, we uh, have 75 lectures currently posted and we have had almost a half million viewings of the lectures. So clearly having a virtual opportunity to be able to find clinical experience is important for the students seeking a career in healthcare. Tonight, we are very excited to have our guest who's uh, taken time out of his very busy schedule in a specialty that I've watched grow during my long career, one of the most essential types of medical practice uh, for the care of the, the total care of our patients. And so please welcome our exciting guest. <clears throat> and Rohit, would you please introduce our speaker for the evening? Tonight's speaker is Dr. Sid, who is a physical medicine and rehabilitation resident. And everyone, please welcome Dr. Sid. Hey guys, uh, just wanna say uh, thanks for having me today. Um, it's really incredible what you guys as a team have put together. Um, specifically, uh, you know, Dr. Fowler having 70, I, I believe you said almost 70 plus lecturers come into this uh, atmosphere is, is just incredible. Um, and I truly think this is one of the best ways for you guys to learn the inside details about a specialty that otherwise I didn't even know about until I got to medical school. So um, happy to talk to you guys. Um, it's going to be a very informal uh, lecture. Um, goal is to just educate you guys about what I do on a day to day basis, what the field uh, stands for, and um, and happy to take any questions at the, uh, at the appropriate time. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. So again, my name is Dr. Siddhartha Mopathy. Most people call me Dr. Sid. Uh, I'm a third year resident at uh, Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center. Uh, if you guys haven't heard of it, it's typically referred to as the President's Hospital because that's where all the diplomats or the uh, political parties get treated. Um, and most recently it became famous for uh, our previous president, Donald Trump, um, uh, being admitted for coronavirus. So. But that being said, uh, we'll continue on. Um, Sounds good, thank you. As I was mentioning, um, I was uh, born in India, um, was raised there until I was three years old, uh, then moved to the United States to the wonderful city of Dover, Delaware. Um, I was telling Dr. Fowler earlier that when I tell people that, usually their first response is, oh, you're the first person I've ever met from Delaware. Um, I then somehow uh, went from being a small town, um, small state uh, boy to heading over to the University of Miami, um, also known as the U, um, the one that's actually in Miami, Florida, not the Ohio Miami. Um, did my undergraduate there, uh, did a 
dual degree in biology as well as economics. Um, and then went on to receive the HPSB scholarship um, through the military, uh, specifically with the uh, Army branch. Um, joined the military over the summer between my undergraduate and medical school, and then uh, proceeded to go on to Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine in um, Philadelphia. Um, reason why I specify Philadelphia is because it also has three branch or two other branches in Georgia. Um, it was an amazing time. Uh, I believe that it really did help me with um, a lot of the skills that I use in my PM&R uh, medical field almost on a daily basis. And i um, excited to talk about that later on as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm currently in my uh, third year of residency uh, out of four years. I plan on uh, continuing on my education to do a pain fellowship. And um, I have uh, interest in sports. Uh, I love to play basketball and football. I love to watch basketball and football. Um, I'm a huge foodie. If uh, you guys need any recommendations in Philadelphia, Miami, or DC, or the three cities that I have lived in, I'm happy to give it to you guys. Um, I enjoy hiking. Uh, I am a gamer, so just like many of you guys, uh, I've grown up playing video games uh, my entire life, and my favorite place to be is the beach, because I feel like that's the most relaxing place in the world, and I always want to go back to Miami, so <laughs> that's part of it. So getting started, um, what is PM&R? Um, that question is asked to me probably, it's probably one of the most frequent questions I get. Uh, for a long time, my mom and Dad had no idea because I've never heard of the specialty. And so I try to take it upon it uh, to help spread that awareness of what we do and what we stand for. Um, so the Greek uh, origin of this name, physiatry is what we feel is uh, also called, is uh, physikos, which is, stands for physical, and then iatry, which is the art of healing. So physical um, healing. And so our goal uh, in any of the patients that we see is to restore function and then improve quality of life. And when you really think about that at the simplest level, that is probably one of the most important things to a patient. Um, and I think that goes quite understated and it doesn't get passed on as much as it probably should have uh, in prior years in medicine. But as uh, I had mentioned that the field has grown uh, immersely and there's a lot of resources being put into rehabilitation um, from a physical, mental, um, cardiogenic, neuro, uh, neurology standpoint. So there's a huge, huge, huge push uh, on how to make these patients not only survive whatever can but um, also to restore that function and that quality of life that they might have lost after, um, after whatever they're suffering through. Um, and a perfect example of that is uh, things like cancer COVID life example that we're going through today. Um, um, and the, the beauties behind the field, it takes a very holistic approach. Um, we don't look at pain in the knee as just pain in the knee. We look at it and say, hey, is that pain coming from higher up? Is it coming from the hip? Is it coming from the ankle? Um, are they having some sort of like altered uh, biomechanics from higher up? Is there pain elsewhere? Is there a reason for why they might have some degeneration in their cartilage? You look at it from all aspects. Is there any um, nutritional deficits? Is there any enzymatic conditions that's leading to it? Um, so you look at a handful of things before we just say, oh, he just has knee pain. So um, you treat the whole patient, not the body part. You treat um, the underlying solution, not the symptom. So I can't stress that enough. It doesn't matter what field you go into. I really want you guys to hone into the idea of treating the patient and not the symptom. Um, so a little bit basics about the specialty itself. It's a four-year um, residency program. Uh, you complete your first year as a transitional year, uh, a, a prelim medicine year, or you can also do a surgical preliminary year. Um, all three of those are valid um, in terms of your prerequisite before you start your three years of actual pm &R training. And the uh, reason behind that is with a lot of specialties such as opto radiology um, and many more, you become so specialized in your field, you don't wanna lose track of those basic medical skill sets that you learn throughout med school. 
So you spend your first year really getting uh, your hands on ICU, internal medicine, um, pediatrics, um, even ob -GYN. I did ob -GYN as an intern, um, even though I'll never do it again. It's good to have a exposure to it because you really never know um, what could be causing someone's pain. And then you have to have those little things in the back of your mind that's outside of your own scope of your specialty uh, to know when to refer. And then uh, there are a slew of fellowship programs that you can do after completing your um, physical medicine and rehab residency. And uh, I believe I get into that later on in the lecture. Um, as I was saying, I actually get onto it in the next slide. So some of the fellowship trainings that you can do right after is hospice and palliative care. Um, you can go into neuromuscular medicine. You can go into pain medicine, which is what I'm interested in. Um, you can go into uh, sports and spine, um, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, um, pediatric. Um, there's even cardiac rehab. So there's plenty of opportunities in what you can specialize even after doing um, a four-year residency. So lots of opportunity, lots of places that uh, have a need for rehab and the field is continuously expanding. So that's, that's always an exciting part about it. Um, so our approach uh, always as, as I can't hammer in enough is to evaluate what a person's function was prior to their illness and what is the goal of their function after their illness? Of course, the goal should always be to restore their function as close as possible to prior to whatever has hospitalized them, prior to whatever um, dysfunction has occurred, prior to whatever disability that they might have um, uh, inquired and acquired. And then um, the other thing is improving quality of life. So if we are not able to get them to that level of function, if you have a patient who, in my population specifically, working at a military hospital, you have a patient who has um, an IED blast that results in them having to have their leg amputated. Of course, we can try to maximize their function by putting a prosthetic knee, prosthetic leg, prosthetic limb, um, and helping them through physical therapy. But what else can we do for that patient? Is there anything that we can um, adapt and change in their home? Is there a ramp that we can set up for their entry to their house? Is there a first level setup that we can do? Uh, there's a lot of things to take into consideration other than just treating the patient at the simplest level. So the goal is a combined um, aspect of both of those two uh, things that I've mentioned, function and quality of life. And the goal is to maximize both. And that's truly the best way to achieve um, the best form of rehabilitation for these patients. Um, we do a lot of uh, pharmacological and non-pharmacological non modalities. Um, and so one of the things that I hold dear to me is my uh, osteopathic manipulative uh, training. Um, and so anytime I see a patient who has myofascial pain or muscular uh, strain or ligamentous uh, sprains, um, I will feel happy to at least attempt to uh, use some of my um, osteopathic skill sets to help assist them. And, um, uh, and uh, Sib, we've already gotten a good question from Danielle who said, do you feel like your osteopathic training prepared you uniquely for hands-on field like pm and uh, I believe it definitely helped. Um, I will say that my MD colleagues have uh, been extremely interested in learning some of the maneuvers that we do to help with realigning um, even like the spine. Uh, or doing some soft tissue manipulations for people who have, for example, tight uh, trapezius muscle or tight uh, paraspinal musculature. Um, they're extremely excited to learn about that stuff. Um, I will say during our osteopathic training, we learn about a lot, a lot, a lot of the special tests that we do to help uh, build a diagnosis. Um, and so that was some feedback that I was given from a couple of my MD colleagues that they didn't um, spend as much time learning some uh, special tests that help with physical exam maneuvers. But, you know, you can learn all of that. Uh, none of it's none of it's crazy complicated. It's all very straightforward for the most part. And it's maybe it was just earlier exposure and I felt more comfortable, but um, I don't see a big difference between MD or DOs in terms of the way that they practice in the PMR field. And both are very happy to learn from each other in terms of uh, their original training that they've had. So um, I think it's very, very good question. Um, and to answer it, um, I, I definitely felt very comfortable transitioning into, into my field. 
we we love DOs in our program here. We we take 22 residents every year, and seven of our new residents this year, starting in July, were our DOs, and so uh, we love this skill set, and it's very helpful to us to be to be okay. with them. Yeah, happy to hear that, and uh, it's it's something that you know we continue to um, we try to use our skill set when we can. Uh, I will. Be honest in the sense that if you're outside of the spectrum of PMNR or ortho um, or neuro, um, it might be harder to integrate some of those skill sets that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in our fields. Um, but definitely, uh, they do bring a nice uh, holistic approach, and I, I believe it's definitely helpful in any setting. And um, definitely learned a lot from my MD colleagues as well, and, and how they were trained. And so, it's it's good that a lot of these residency programs are are very uh, mix nowadays and um the ACGME has basically taken over both so um it's definitely been a, a pleasure uh to to learn from both sides um and to continue um we the one of the best parts about PMNR is it's a very interdisciplinary approach and so when I say that we work from everybody from uh we work with physical therapy, we work with occupational therapy, we work with speech therapy, we work with orthopedics, we work with neurosurgery, we work with neurology. Um, a lot of internal medicine doctors reach out to us when they're not familiar with something. Um, and they say, hey, this pa patient has, uh, uh, has paresthesias of the skin, or they have um, a, a neuropathy or polyneuropathy, they have tingling and numbness. Um, hey, PMNR, can you guys evaluate this patient with an EMG? And well, a lot of you uh, might not know what that is, but it's a test used to detect the health of a nerve to see um, if there's any damage to the axon or to the uh, insulation around the nerve. So there's a lot of little things that PMNR does that goes under the radar uh, until you get into the medical field. And I don't expect medical students or even pre-health students to really know that. Um, Dr. Fowler can probably chip in on about this, but it you, you're probably still learning more and more, uh, right, sir, about like all the the skill sets and tools that that they have to offer, especially with the the evol evolution of the ultrasound and all that stuff that we're now doing nowadays. No question, you know, ultrasound guided procedures, scaling blocks for putting shoulders back in, for example, is something we're now doing regularly that we had no idea, you know, how to do that, much less do it safely, you know, when I was trained. Yep, definitely. Um, and so we, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Fowler was mentioning, we, we love to ultrasound. Um, if we can't tell what's going on, we'll throw a probe on there and we'll start looking to see if there's any edema, if there's any inflammation around the nerve, is a nerve entrapped anywhere? Um, is there any dislocation? Is the meniscus um, popping out? Is there a uh, tear in your supraspinatus rotator cuff muscle? There's just so much utility to it. And as you guys uh, evolve through this field, um, you'll see that technology is only getting better and better. And what used to be a very difficult um, technology to have in house in, in office has become as portable as connecting it to your iPad using something called the butterfly where you can just plug in a probe and you can ultrasound anywhere. So well, let's, um, let's, let's take that, you know, you take a, someone that you think has a rotator cuff tear of the shoulder now you can actually go in and visualize it and actually see the darn thing and, and know exactly what you're treating. That is correct, sir. And one of the beauties behind it is nowadays what we're doing is instead of just doing a landmark guided injection, which there's been plenty of studies that show that um, the accuracy is very poor with landmark, um, unless you're doing an intraarticular joint um, injection, which is just, you know, you can get into the joint space. And that will have the same efficacy as using an ultrasound because you're just injecting into the joint. But if you're really trying to target something as specific as um, there's, as many of you guys might not know, there's four rotator cuff muscles. And so when you're trying to isolate which one is torn and you are able to visualize it and you're able to directly go to the point of the partial tear and inject, it makes a huge difference in terms of the patient's um, outcome. So it's, change the field completely, um, even in terms of simple things like carpal tunnel. Nowadays, what we're doing, and ortho is very impressed with this as well. Ortho typically used to do carpal tunnel releases with um, an incision at the wrist, and they'd go in and explore and release the uh, ligament that lays above the median nerve to kind of free up some space for patients who suffer with, uh, from carpal tunnel. 
nowadays and, we're and, and, and when you're doing your injections now to a joint or to a tendon uh, or a tendon sheath imagine not visual Im imagine doing them without visualizing i mean you visualize everything now but we were doing it blindly years ago exactly sir and then um nowadays we're doing carpal tunnel releases with ultrasound guidance and so you make a smaller incision it has a little uh projection of like a blade at the end of it um that's able able to be manipulated and we just do a small little sheep um smaller incision faster recovery time all due to the the beauty behind how technology has advanced with ultrasound so that is something that people um don't really know about pmnr we are trained in emg which is something that neurology has historically had its dominance in but we actually have to be certified in doing over 200 emgs throughout our residency um and then we also um, partake in ultrasound, we partake in pain procedures, a slew of uh, different procedures that we're able to do, um, more uh, tapping into regenerative medicine, which is the new, new, new hot topic in uh, any sort of sports care. Um, you guys might have heard of it, PRP, which is um, platelet-rich plasma injections. Um, the idea is it's recruiting a bunch of growth factors to an area and helping not only with pain relief, but also with uh, regeneration of some of the the, uh, the tissue structure that's in the area. And so, so, Sid, so Sid, you've done specific ultrasound rotations during your residency? Correct. And so almost if, when we're on our outpatient clinic uh, blocks, we have two days that are designated for ultrasound clinic. And so residents get to rotate through um, our sports clinic, which is Primarily, you're going to throw the probe on there um, when you're evaluating a patient. And then ultrasound clinic, which is designated for patients who have already been evaluated and who need a specific procedure. Um, typically, it's going to involve prolotherapy, PRP, steroid injection, um, visco supplementation if it's like a knee joint, um, lots of different injection therapies that we do. And I think for the benefit of the students, the four-dimensional visualization, and it, it, it is four dimensions because it's space and time. These things are moving. Yep. Um, that the four-dimensional visualization of anatomical structures is absolutely the way of the future. So any one of you out there, all nearly 200 of you out there that are listening to uh, Dr. Sid right now, just know that you're going to have to become an anatomical expert uh, in the years going forward. Go ahead, Sid. Right. And uh, as, as Dr. Fowler is saying, it, it's going to be important for any field. So ultrasound is cheap. It is. And you guys will come to learn that medicine. Um, also, you have to partake the idea of finance into it. And so you cannot just order an MRI on any patient that you want. You can't just order um, pain procedures on anyone you want. You have to go through the ladder of steps before insurance will even go through with it. Um, and so ultrasound nobody will have an objection to. It is very cheap. It's uh, available to scan at any point. Um, if you have it available in your clinic, um, you can just pull it into any encounter and just start scanning. And so as, as long as it's time permitting, but um, it's and becoming- And it's, it's also harmless and painless. Exactly. Harmless, painless. Um, you don't have to worry about any radiation, none of that. So um, it is definitely the future. And- mm -hmm. We have one of few machines in the world that is currently at 75 hertz in terms of frequency. Um, and I'm telling you, you can literally see the fascicles of a nerve <laughs> with the machine that we have. And so that is a rare machine, but it's going to become the common machine. So um, I would advise all of you guys to, when you guys are looking at programs, see what resources that they have to offer you, see what um, equipment that they have available. Um, that's not a deal breaker when you're coming to decide, but definitely keep that in mind because a program that has some things that you might be using in the future or might want to be interested in using in the future is definitely something you want to keep in mind when you're deciding. Um, but anyways, I digress. I kind of went off on a little tangent about um, mm -hmm. those little things that we do, but back to the idea of the inter disciplinary team, um, we work with all of these specialties. Um, we even work with plastics. Uh, we have this special clinic called um, Peripheral Nerve Clinic, which meets every uh, third Thursday of the month. 
And that is basically a meeting of the minds. We have the chief of plastics, the chief of um, neurosurgery, the chief of neurology, the chief of PMNR, um, the chief of ortho, all gather at one clinic. And we take these completely complex patients. And again, I'm coming from a military uh, hospital setting where we have a lot of patients who unfortunately go through um, gun injuries or you know, IED blasts and they have severed nerves and we do nerve transpositions. Um, we test the health of a nerve so we can let plastics know whether they can take that nerve and place it somewhere else to activate a different muscle. Um, we test muscles. We, there's just so much utility for that interdisciplinary team to work. And it's truly special to see what happens when you get all of these minds working together to, again, maximize function and increase the quality of life of, of a patient who um, that might take like six months to do if they, if they weren't able to kind of get that interdisciplinary approach. Right. So um, super important. And I can't thank our therapists enough. Um, they do a lot of the groundwork once we've already built a diagnosis. Um, physical therapy is great for helping with strengthening, proprioception, um, balance, and all that stuff. Occupational therapy is great at enhancing um, and evaluating patients' ability to complete their ADLs. And for pa uh, people who don't know what ADLs is, it's activities of daily living. And you have something called IADLs as well. And essentially that's more of the higher level form of uh, activities of daily living. So. Activities of daily living would include like bathing, toileting, um, grooming, et cetera, feeding yourself and all that stuff. And so occupational therapy helps with that a lot, um, helps with figuring out different ways to manipulate um, patients in ways that they can use whatever function that they do have um, using orthotics, um, using different prosthetics um, and a bunch of different tools uh, to get the patient to as high a level of function as they can. Um, and then you have your speech therapist. So you have a lot of patients that we deal with in stroke care or brain injury where you need to maximize their ability to have a uh, cognitive function or truly with speech. Um, and so, or even with swallowing, they, they do really, uh, it's, it's truly a whole team um, approach, which makes this specialty so, so special because you see every um department kind of doing their job. And then the final picture is a patient who's coming out of something that you might not have ever thought they would come out of um, looking like they're actually able to live a, a decent life again. So um, again, uh, I already stressed on this, on this next slide, we work with a slew of different um, uh, specialties and it's, it's truly amazing um, what, what we're able to do when, uh, when you're able to combine each of our strengths. You know, uh, Sid, uh, as you're, and I, I know you're going to get into this, but for the students listening tonight, now it's approaching 200 kids that are really hanging on everything you're saying here. As you approach taking care of people, it's about trying to get them to be able to do what they've been doing. I mean, think how important it is to be able to walk to the bathroom and go pee or be able to brush your hair or wipe your butt, you know, what Sid is right in the middle of is helping evaluate what the problem is uh, and then be able to help restore people to do their daily functions. And so that's why this is such a critical thing for you to hear about for those of you who are approaching the total care of your patients. That's absolutely correct, uh, Dr. Fowler. And, you know, one of our biggest goals, like you mentioned, is just to be able to get them as close as possible to whatever they were like prior to injury. And so, um, for example, I had a patient yesterday who uh, has a above the knee amputation. We were able to get him a microprocessor knee. Um, he has an ankle that gives him a little bit of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion um, and also eversion inversion. Um, and with a lot of help from physical therapy and their training, um, he's so functional now that he's able to go on hikes. He's able to bike. He's able to, um, switch on a swimming leg and he's able to swim. Um, these are hobbies that people were doing prior to whatever injury they might've had. And so just think about having that taken away from you. It's, it's jeopard, like it's jeopardizing your mental health. It's jeopardizing your physical health, um, 
there's just so many aspects. And one thing that was truly inspiring, I, I get inspired by my patients almost on an everyday basis, because at the end of the day, they also have to put in the work um, to get back to where they're at. Our job is to make it as easy as possible for them. And this gentleman yesterday that who had the above the knee amputation, um, he told me that he gained a hundred pounds after his initial amputation. Um, he is a war veteran who unfortunately on an uh, IED blast um, and lost his leg, gained a hundred pounds, was unable to do any of the things that he loved doing, was in a wheelchair for quite a long time, but worked hard to get back to where he's at right now with a microprocessor knee and all of this um, prosthetics, uh, thanks to the prosthetics team, physical therapy, um, our adjustments that we make. Um, and now he's lost that hundred pounds again. And so it's truly incredible what you can do for an individual um, with, with some of the changes and some of the resources that we have. And um, something that I didn't hit on yet, um, but is definitely a huge portion of our role is the avoidance of surgery until absolutely need be. And that's specifically more so related with neurosurgery and ortho. And they love sending our pa uh, patients to us when they don't think a patient is um, necessarily ready for surgery or if there's contraindications to surgery. And so I'll give you guys an example. Um, if you have a 70 year old um, female who has osteoarthritis in her right knee, is in severe pain, is no longer able to walk because of that. Um, that's definitely impacting her quality of life, but she also has a lot of cardio, uh, cardiac history, um, has uncontrolled diabetes, and is not a candidate uh, for surgery. So you cannot do a knee replacement on her. Um, what can we offer? So we offer everything from doing a steroid injection into the knee, um, PRP injections into the knee, which is the regenerative medicine that I spoke on earlier. Um, and even something cooler is uh, we're able to burn some of the nerves that innervate that joint. And so what we are now doing nowadays is something called a uh, genicular nerve block, where we block the nerves that innervate the, the knee joint. And if it gives them more than 50% relief, we go ahead and say, okay, well, that's one of the pain generators for this patient. Let's get rid of that pain for them. And so we go in and we take a little probe um, and we heat up the very end of the tip and it's called a radio frequency ablation and it ablates the nerve. Um, and all of this is done under either ultrasound guidance or under fluoroscopy. And for those of you who don't, uh, who are not familiar with fluoroscopy, um, it is live x-ray guidance. And so it is, I'm gonna nerd out here a little bit, but it is some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen. So imagine having an x-ray film, but you're able to physically watch the needle go into the, to the space that you want it to go into. Um, it's really mind blowing technology that we have nowadays. And it gives these patients a lot of, uh, a lot of symptomatic relief. And, um, you know, if you can delay surgery for a patient who, um, otherwise in the past might've tried it, even though they had all these, uh, these conditions or might've never been able to get any relief due to the fact that surgery won't touch them because of all their other medical conditions. Over the, um, over the, over the years, Sid, I, <clears throat> I'm, you know, I'm an old man and I've seen so many patients and over the years, it is difficult to say to all these kids that are watching tonight, how disabling it is to have a knee that doesn't work. Uh, that is so painful from osteoarthritis, from cartilage damage, ligament damage and so forth. And how just horribly disabling. And what I've noted over the years is that when these folks who can have a joint replacement go in and get a total knee, their mobility is restored. It's like God's gift to them. It's unbelievable. That's absolutely correct, uh, Dr. Fowler. And it's almost one of the best feelings when a patient comes back and says, hey, I'm finally able to run a mile again, and I haven't been able to do it in three years. And so to hear things like that, or to simply even say, hey, I'm able to go up the stairs in my house. I don't have to stay on the first floor anymore. Um, these things are incredibly humbling to hear. And it's, it's what keeps me going and what I do every day. Um, and then, and then, you know, you have somebody who say weighs 350 pounds who has a terrible knee arthritis. And you know that this person is not a candidate for surgery at all. Nobody's going to operate. On them. And so that's where you guys especially come in and say, okay, well, how can at least we can re somehow restore their mobility, the genicular nerve block you mentioned and so on and so on. Correct, sir. Um, 
And again, another example is when a neurosurgery is not comfortable with doing a fusion on a patient. Um, you know, sometimes we'll throw in an epidural injection. Um, we're able to do discectomies. We're able to, uh, you know, that's a little bit more far advanced into the pain medicine field, but depending on the program you're at, um, you know, we partake in our pain clinic as well. And so depending on which program you go to, they might have a little bit more um, involvement in the pain procedures, maybe a little bit less. Uh, again, this is where finding out, these are the questions you guys need to uh, look forward to and ask whether you're going into PMNR or not. Um, you need to ask, hey, what uh, higher level procedures or what higher level uh, techniques are you guys doing at your institution? Um, what are you guys able to provide in terms of uh, the higher level uh, resources? And so, when you go to an interview, when you're a medical student and you're at the level of applying for residency, you have to think to yourself that they want you um, and we want them. And so it's a conversation. It's not a one-way interview. And I, I, I want to stress that because a lot of times we can get scared into not asking the questions that we truly want to know. Um, but you got to remember, this is your life moving forward. This is going to be your career. There's going to be... Um, your last bit of training that you have under some amazing, um, amazing attendings, such as uh, Dr. Fowler and, and what he's able to do at uh, UT Southwestern, but a slew of these institutions, you guys should feel comfortable asking, hey, like what, what do you guys have to offer uh, in terms of certain, certain interests that you might have? So I, I do uh, stress that you guys keep that in, the, in, in your mind um, to, always remember that, hey, this is, yes, they want, I mean, you want them, you want to get a residency spot with them, but in a sense, they also want, um, they also want uh, a, a strong worker and someone who's willing to learn. Um, so in PM&R, we are not only an outpatient-based uh, field, we do a lot of inpatient. Um, specifically, you'll see us in patients who have like spinal cord injury, um, stroke, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, Guillain-Barre, which is a um, length-dependent polyneuropathy, um, in burn care, in uh, orthopedic, like post-surgical care, uh, pediatric rehabilitation, kids who have uh, like cystic fibrosis, cerebral palsy. Uh, a lot of these patients need rehab for one or another uh, reason. Um, and typically in this setting, we are doing more so of what you would think like almost internal medicine is doing. Uh, we're doing a lot of medical management. We're doing a lot of uh, functional assessment. Um, for example, in a patient who might have a stroke, um, they'll end up with some contractures uh, due to uh, being hemiplegic. And we will try to help um, balance that with maybe adding baclofen, which is an antispasticity medication. Um, and you have to balance it because too much of it will make them too flaccid. I mean, yeah, too flaccid and too little of it, they were not even gonna be able to range their extremity. Um, in addition, we're able to do Botox injections. Um, we're able to do steroid injections into joints if patients have pain while they're trying to rehab in the hospital. Um, and a huge portion is pain management. Um, that's becoming more and more important uh, topic and I've, very proud of a lot of my colleagues in internal medicine and in many other fields who will rely on us to manage pain because truly it's very easy to just throw opioids at a patient, um, which has been the prior historical option when a patient is has like uncontrollable pain. But as you guys uh, go through your medical training, um, I urge you to differentiate the type of pain. And so there are multiple medications that you can use, whether it be for inflammation, whether it be for neuro neuropathic pain, whether it be to uh, a patient who has a mu uh, muscle spasm. There are plenty of different drugs that can target each of those things and none of those being an opioid. So if you're not comfortable with managing pain, then I urge you to reach out to somebody like pain medicine or PM&R who is more comfortable with that. Um, and that's again, another place where our field really does come in handy. Um, outpatient wise, that's a lot of, uh, what we've already kind of talked about. Um, outpatient is heavy, 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 uh, MSK related. So you'll see patients either being treated for sports injuries or, um, chronic pain, um, or even the post-stroke, uh, patients who come in for, uh, Botox injections, uh, 
every six months. Um, we do occipital nerve blocks for patients who have migraines, um, you name it. And if it has to do with a nerve, a muscle, we're probably able to do it. <laughs> um, and again, you might see in the private practice setting, um, PM and R doctors will be working uh, sometimes in big, larger groups. And these larger groups typically will involve a pain doctor, an orthopedic doctor, and a general physiatrist or PM&R doctor. Um, some of the conditions that we treat, um, as I was mentioning, um, from an MSK standpoint, we see a lot of uh, low back, <laughs> neck pain, um, two of the most common complaints in, uh, in the world. Uh, no matter where you go, people are going to have low back pain or neck pain. And I can go on and on and on about the different etiologies of back pain and why it's very important to get someone who has constant back pain, who's not being treated with like the normal things that you would do, like physical therapy to somebody like a specialist in pain or physical medicine. Um, there's just a slew of different things that could be causing it. And unless you're uh, specialty trained in it, it's very hard to um, decipher the, the different things. Um, we treat, uh, I've, 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 I've heard people say, why do people get low back pain? He says, and I say, it's because we chose to walk upright two or 3 million years ago. <laughs> and, now, and now you got the lumbar spine holding up the upper half of the body. That's definitely true. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we there's plenty of reasons to have low back pain. I mean, I'm 28 years old and I have low back pain and it's because of the years of studying <laughs> and leaning over. So, um, it's definitely a common thing that we see. Um, and people will have different reasons for it. Just to name a few, you can have discogenic, which is coming from the intervertebral disc itself. You can have vertebrogenic, which is, um, innervated by the basal vertebral nerve. You can have facetogenic, which is the facet joints between the two vertebrae. You can have uh, nerve root inflammation, which is more commonly called radiculitis. Um, you could have inflammation around the spinal cord. You can have ligamentum flavum, which is a ligament that um, is on the posterior aspect of the spine that could be pressing against the spinal cord. I could keep going. <laughs> There's a slew of reasons. And so unless you're truly trained um, to decipher between those, it is very, it's gonna be a very difficult task to actually solve that problem. And again, this comes back to my original point that I initially made. I urge all of you guys, regardless of what specialty you go into, to always try to treat the patient and not the symptom. It is very easy to cover up their back pain, but it is not going to be the solution to the problem. And they will continue to come back um, until you're actually able to get to the source. So, uh, Sid, how often do you have someone come in, it's a back problem or a knee problem or whatever, and they've been putting it up, putting up with it for a long time and just denying and denying and denying and they finally come in for help i mean do you have some folks that have really been putting up with it for a long time oh yeah yeah we get patients who say that <laughs> you know the, like the the question that we always ask like oh okay like how long has it been going on for you'll have the patients who'll say like oh yeah doc it started two weeks ago which is great um because it's acute and they're trying to get care immediately but then you'll have the patient especially in the military population because nobody wants to come in and actually see the doctor, um, you'll get the patients who are close to retirement and they want to get all of their medical care done before they get out. And you'll say, you'll hear them say like, Oh yeah, doc, like I've been having this pain for 10 years. And so, um, it, you, you'll get both ends of the spectrum. Um, I will say the ones who have had it for longer, um, becomes a little bit bigger of an issue because usually the degeneration is much worse. Um, or if it's, uh, something like a herniation and it was never treated properly. Um, you can have long-term effects on the health of the nerve, which is where we would rely on EMG to test, uh, you know, how their nerves are doing, but, um, you're, you're absolutely spot on. It's, it's definitely one of those situations where people, if they're diligent about it, will come in early, but, um, uh, you know, we definitely get the people who come in uh, a lot later as well. Uh, Sid, do you think that COVID and the inability to get doctor appointments or the distances caused by COVID has affected people's chronic nature that they've, a lot of people have not gotten care because they just couldn't get in because of COVID? Yeah, we felt really bad about that because when COVID hit, um, you know, one of the beauties behind PMNR is it's quote unquote elective procedures. Right. So none of what we do is going to be life saving or uh, detrimental to the patient's health immediately at that moment. 
And so we get thrown into the category of an elective procedure. Um, same with an ACL surgery um, that ortho does, um, same with a carpal tunnel release, um, same with even a fusion that neurosurgery might do. All of these become tossed into the bucket of elective surgeries. Um, yes, the patient might be in pain, but is it life threatening? No. And so during COVID, our clinic went down in terms of patients. Uh, we, we run a full clinic usually, um, you know, like we see patients from eight o'clock all the way until about 4 35 PM. And we have like six clinics within our clinic doing different, uh, subspecialties when that all of them are usually full. And so during COVID, I would say we, we cut down almost down to like 25% of what we usually see. Um, and that was very unusual for us residents because as you guys all know, as residents, you're constantly working, but during COVID, it was the first time that we were looking for work because we had, we, we just weren't uh, able to maintain that population that would usually come in because everyone was scared to uh, come in, especially in the, in the early phases. Now we're back full, fully functioning, um, you know, thankfully. And uh, so far we haven't had any COVID outbreaks or any um, infections within our clinic that we know of at least. So uh, Sid, please go ahead. Okay. Um, and then, so other conditions that uh, we commonly will be consulted on is patients who have a need for cardiac rehabilitation. There's been plenty of studies um, in the ICU setting uh, where getting a patient out of bed um, within like the first week after, uh, you know, they're stable is hugely uh, detrimental to their success of rehabbing. And so, there's constant ongoing research on how early rehabilitation is helping patients in multiple um, multiple areas of medicine. So something to keep in mind. Um, other things involving like pulmonary, we have a lot of patients that we've seen post COVID, um, COPD, and then of course, rehabilitation for patients who are currently going undergoing like chemotherapy. Um, they get extremely fatigued, they muscles atrophy and there's a balance between medications and what they're able to tolerate and how much of it they're able to tolerate. So a lot of conditions. Um, Nero is one of our probably heaviest uh, treated conditions. And so we do everything in the spectrum of neuro really other than seizures. Um, we treat all movement disorders. We treat motor neuron disease. We treat peripheral neuropathy. We treat spinal cord injuries. We treat strokes. We treat traumatic brain injuries. We treat multiple sclerosis. Um, ALS, uh, you know, a slew of different um, neurological conditions. Um, so what does this look in pra like pra uh, in practice? So some of the examples that I just like to go over is um, different kind of specialties or subspecialties that we offer. And so if you're dealing with someone who has a traumatic brain injury, um, some of your important things that you want to focus on are improving their cognitive um, and social functioning. Um, a lot of these patients who undergo uh, head trauma, it's truly surprising how much their function is altered. Um, their memory is usually very poor. Their short-term memory is very poor. I've had patients who I see them every day, but they ask me who I am um, almost on a daily basis. And, you know, you're working to improve their memory or working to improve their social interactions um, and trying to target what we can do to help them return to a functional standpoint so they can one, return to work, return to their families. So, um, a lot of important things there. Um, next, shifting gears a little, acute disc herniation in the back. Um, of course, in order to partake in physical therapy, uh, you need to have a little bit of pain relief. And so a lot of disc herniations will resolve on their own, but it takes time. And so in the interim, what we can do as a physiatrist is we can do an epidural injection to help at least reduce the inflammation and give them some pain relief so they can actively participate in core strengthening, um, back exercises uh, that will stabilize the spine and help the herniation uh, resolve, all while avoiding um, surgery. Uh, so for post hip replacements, um, sometimes we can uh, do some injections to the superficial aspects of the hip, um, including some superficial nerves that might be irritated or might be injured during the actual hip surgery itself. Um, goal again is to decrease pain and then help them improve their gait. Um, and as simple as sprained ankle, we do everything from um, strengthening um, to increasing range of motion to increasing proprioception. 
And a lot of the times we'll do goal oriented uh, rehab. So if they're a athlete, um, their type of rehab will be different for their ankle compared to someone who might just be working at uh, a desk job. And so it's all targeted rehabilitation. We try to avoid doing like a general, like, um, you know, cast in that and just treat, treat all of them the same. So it's, it's very interesting patient to patient. Um, post MI, of course, to optimize cardiopulmonary function, uh, spinal cord injury, a huge thing is bowel and bladder. Um, when a patient has a spinal cord injury, they usually lose their, uh, their ability to control their bowel or bladder, um, sometimes resulting in constipation. So you have to manage, uh, how to, uh, develop a system that allows them to empty their bladder or sorry, their bowels. Um, and also they might have either overactive or underactive, um, uh, bladder, which can be detrimental and life-threatening. Um, cause as Dr. Fowler could definitely, um, can definitely uh, chime in on, but having a bladder rupture is a very, very serious uh, medical condition. And it, it can be a very difficult one to treat, um, especially in, in the setting of infection. Um, and of course, post-stroke, there's just so much that we have to offer, especially with spasticity and improving their gait and just getting them back to the best condition that they can be to uh, participate with their family and the community. So that brings us to our first Q&A session. So we have a couple of questions lined up for you. Um, one question that a lot of students were interested in is, is there any role for physician assistants and NPs to work in PM&R or is it a physician only uh, specialty? I think there's definitely a role for PAs and NPs. Um, all of these physical exam maneuvers I can teach to even a medical student or even an undergraduate student. It's more or less putting the pieces together to determine what they uh, come together to mean um, and to help build a diagnosis. And so we definitely have uh, a PA in our clinic to, like right now that is able to see patients alongside of us um, who definitely helps with uh, directing patient care. Um, of course, some of the procedures will be deferred to us physicians, but um, they're definitely very capable in helping to make a diagnosis and then um, diagnosing on their own once they feel comfortable and then um, directing care, whether they need a procedure, whether they need uh, an EMG or whether they need more imaging. A um, lot of room for NPs and PAs uh, as well in our clinics. Thank you for telling us about uh, PAs and NPs and PM and NR. Uh, another question that a student has, was there a specific reason you chose the army for the HPSP? as opposed to the Navy or the Air Force? Great question. Um, so the Army, um, I chose mainly based on what bases were and what locations. And so the Army typically has uh, some of the more major cities. And so, of course, Walter Reed is in the DMV area. So we're very close to Washington, DC. It's um, in Bethesda, Maryland, but you literally go three miles and you're in Washington, DC. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. myself. Um, other bases that I've been to, one is in San Antonio. There's one in uh, Tacoma, Washington, which is 40 minutes away from Seattle. There's one in Honolulu, Hawaii. There's one in Colorado Springs. Um, they just have really good locations. And so, and they have great hospitals. Um, Walter Reed is a, is a worldwide known hospital and probably some of the best training um, you can, you could ask for. So, um, Army just had a lot of resources, uh, a lot of different locations that have appealed to me. And um, I'm very happy with, with my decision thus far. Are, are you active military, Sid? I am currently active military. I'm a captain in the military. All right. Thank you for sharing. Uh, another really popular question was, what made you uh, be interested in a DO as opposed to an MD? Um, so to be completely honest with you guys, I applied both. And I got into two MD schools and four DO schools. And the saying, as the saying goes, you know, sometimes you don't get to choose, but luckily I had a couple of choices. Um, one of the MD schools that I had gotten into was known as Quinnipiac and nothing against them. They were just a very new uh, MD school at the time. I think they were on their like third or fourth graduating class at the time. So I didn't know too much about it. Um, I apologize. Give me a second. 
Um, sorry about that. Were you guys able to hear me still? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, just had a, <laughs> a colleague call me, but um, it's nothing important. Um, but yeah, so one of the MD schools I got into was very brand new. Um, the other one I had gotten to was far away from home. And at that same time, I had gotten into another DO school that was far away from home. And I had had my interview at PCOM, which is uh, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, roughly all, all around the same time. But I had not known that I got into PCOM at the time. And so I had a friend, uh, well, my best friend growing up, his older brother went to PCOM. And then a lot of my family members in Delaware knew doctors who were familiar with PCOM's graduates and their alumni who worked both in Delaware, but also in Philadelphia. And so the more research I did, I came to find out that PCOM was one of the first medical schools in Philadelphia in general. It was the second medical school in all of Philadelphia. Um, And I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Philadelphia's medical school situation, but they have UPenn, which was the first one. We were the second one. Um, And then they have Temple, Jefferson, um, Drexel. And so you have literally five medical schools in one space. Um, It's just a great city to learn in because all of us rotate at each other's institutions. Um, And so at the time it was close to home, which again, I'm from Delaware. It was about 30 minute ride to see family. And at the time, I had just left uh, University of Miami, which was super far away. And so for me, it was a combination of hearing a lot of good uh, things about PCOM, um, kind of talking to some family members who were doctors already and giving me good kind of, uh, I guess, positive reinforcement about the current alumni situation and then the resources that they had available as well as the studying styles that they offered. Um, Something I will be completely honest with you guys about. um, I was never good at being a auditory uh, learner. Uh, I can sit in a lecture, but I'm not as good at learning from that situation as I am from reading a book on my own. And you guys will come to see medical schools will have certain (coughs) restrictions depending on where you go. Some medical schools will be mandatory every class you have to be in lecture some uh, some schools will video record the lectures and you can watch, watch them at your own leisure uh, and you can study from um, your own home um, I was more of the type that would study from home I would double speed the lecture I would um, type out my notes and I would sit in a room a uh, study room on my own and just learn and so everyone has their own learning technique um, again for the younger uh, crowd who's listening, I urge you guys to try to figure out what your learning style is. Um, People are going to learn in a variety of different ways. You don't have to prepare yourself, but I do urge you to at least try different um, techniques and see which one works best for you. And so uh, a lot of flexibility. Yeah. When I went to uh, college and later to med school, my oldest brother who was in med school said, go to every single class, sit in the front, write down everything the teacher says go home that night and outline your notes you know turn five pages into one page and for the exam study your outline well you just mentioned about studying virtually from home where you would put them on double speed and Mm -hmm. outline and you would then take notes from that so it's really kind of the same thing you know it's hearing it it's the anamnestic approach to memory you hear it you then hear it again, and then right. you hear it one more time. It's kind, of, it's kind of like what we do for tetanus shots. We give three different shots to raise the, uh, uh, the Im- immunity level. Anyway, it's, it's what I call the anamnestic response to memory, if you will. Yep. Um, and it's definitely helpful for me. So, um, But I also had students who would sit in class, and you know they would learn very well from attending class, and they're auditory learners. And so... Um, they really gathered a lot of information while they were able to sit in class. And so you just got to figure out what's the best learning style for you. Um, I did very well in, in medical school. And so I, I truly think it's either direction is, is, uh, is, a, is a good way or you can mix it and totally individualistic uh, depending on how you study. Um, and back to that question, PCOM just offered a lot of the things that I was looking for location wise, being close to family after being so far away. Um, 
lot of alumni resources around the area. Um, turns out that the, which at the time I didn't know, but um, the assistant program director at my program right now in PMNR is a PCOM alumni. Um, and so they were just very well um, connected and um, had a lot of resources available and they had very good connections with all the other medical schools. And we rotated at all the institutions, which was amazing. And Philadelphia is a great place to, to learn. Um, we took a lot of their students and they took a lot of our students and it, it just really brewed a very good learning uh, experience. Maybe uh, one more Rohit and then we'll go to the second half. Sure, thank you for sharing, especially the advice on how to study. Uh, one more question. What's the work-life balance like for this specialty? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I always love to talk about this when it comes to my specialty. Um, and I was going to bring it up later, but since the question uh, is, is here, I'll go ahead and answer now. Um, going into medicine has always been a passion for me. Um, from the longest time that I can remember, I've always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, at a certain point in my life, I grew up playing sports, as I had mentioned, uh, um, but my father, who was a uh, immigrant in this country, um, had to work very hard to be able to give me uh, half the resources, and I'm extremely thankful uh, to everything that he's been able to provide me um, to be able to be the man that I am today and to be as successful as I am today. And with that comes a lot of loss of time from your family, um, a lot of commitment to your work. Um, and so there's plenty of times where I was at a sporting event and I would do awesome and I would look at the sideline and my dad was not be able to be there. Um, and so that has always hit home for me um, because I knew he was doing that for a better reason. But I also would have loved to have, um, you know, my family members be able to see me succeed both academically, but also um, in all of my other hobbies. Um, so I told myself when I go into medicine, I don't want to compromise my family life uh, when I have the ability to dictate that. And so lifestyle was a very important thing when I was deciphering between my specialties. And you have to be honest with yourself when you get to that stage in life, you have to be honest with yourself about what kind of lifestyle you want to live because with each of these specialties and Dr. Fowler can help you a little bit, you're going to see a slight variation in lifestyle. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, PM&R is considered more of an elective uh, procedural field. Um, there's nothing that we do is, that's gonna be life or death. There's literally nothing that we do that's gonna be life or death. Um, if a patient ever needs to be sent to uh, higher level care, we will transfer them on the inpatient side. And no person who's in a critical condition is gonna to come to our outpatient setting. And so with that, it gives you the flexibility of having a lifestyle where you're able to usually see clinic from eight to four, eight to 4.30, um, and you usually have weekends off. Once you're an attending, it's very rare that you're going to be on call unless you're staffing an inpatient hospital. And even then, there's usually uh, internal medicine hospitalists who are watching over your patients at nighttime. So the field has developed to a certain point where weekends are typically off. Um, as an attending, you're typically not on call. And your workday is usually from anywhere from like 7.30 to 4.30. Um, and you still are able to see and do everything that you want, um, but you never feel pressed to, that, uh, to the extent where things like, oh man, I have to get this done today. And so you'll see that it allots for a lot of flexibility when it comes to scheduling vacation and stuff like that. Um, you just have to block it off early in advance to accommodate for your patients, but your patients are not in a life or death situation. So even if you want to take a vacation for two weeks or something, you can do that. You can shift that uh, care over to one of your colleagues, or you can, you can just tell the patient to wait two weeks um, and you're going to be able to do that. So I will say the lifestyle is, it's truly a thing. Um, even as a resident, uh, I've been able to do a lot of my other hobbies uh, that I've always wanted to, um, a lot of extracurricular activities that I still like doing. Um, and I'm, I'm 
very active in and outside of the hospital. So um, I, I think it's probably one of the best lifestyle specialties in all of medicine, to be completely honest. So, Sid, as we um, head into the second half, firstly, if you need to slip away and get a drink of water or something, please feel free. But uh, on behalf of all the students, uh, we want to say thank you for your service. I want to ask all the students to please put thank you for your service into the chat real quickly. I so appreciate that, uh, So that Dr. Sid uh, can see uh, how very grateful uh, we are for what you're doing. Uh, you, you guys are amazing. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> that was really kind. You need a sip of water or you want to keep going? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll take a quick second. Um, I'll, be, I'll be right back, guys. All right, we'll be right here. Get, get your water and come, on, come right on back. Um, in the meantime, uh, we'll take any questions that have popped up. Um, there may be some that I can answer um, along the way. Um, uh, one of the things that I would like to point out is that, uh, as I know that Dr. Sid is saying uh, is that um, this is a teamwork type approach. It's specialties mixing with specialties so that we can try to get the best possible outcome for our patients. And some of the ones Sid is taking care of are just some of the toughest patients. They've got knee problems, ankle problems, hip problems, back problems, and so forth. And so, and upper, that's lower extremity and then upper extremity problems. And so these are some exceptionally difficult patients that require an entire specialty. I started in medicine long before there was actually a specialty of physical medicine and rehab. And so <clears throat> this specialty of SIDS, Dr. SIDS specialty has emerged because patients realized and physicians realized that actually having uh, a particular type of physician that could specialize in physical medicine and the rehabilitation necessary was something that ultimately would help, would help the patients. Um, and so uh, this is really going very well. Uh, I do want you to know that uh, we're gonna keep being here as long as you keep coming back, folks. Sid, are you back? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to shift back to uh, that screen. Are you guys able to see that? Yes, sir. We're good. Awesome. Great. So um, continuing on, we're, we're getting closer to the, uh, the end of um, this presentation. Um, and I have a couple more things I would like to share after that, but I'd like to go through a quick case with you guys. Something that we see all the time. Um, you have a 44-year-old female presenting with bilateral knee pain. She came in... Um, in 2014, um, when all this pain, uh, or this is when all the pain began in 2014, and it has been gradually worsening and it occurs deep in her knee. And she mentions that it's worse with like prolonged sitting, using stairs and during exercise. Um, she mentions that rest alleviates the pain and that um, thus far she has not had relief with physical therapy. Um, and sometimes it's even limited uh, in participation in physical therapy due to the pain. Um, she says her pain is currently at a six out of 10 and states that she's no longer able to run even more than 0.5 miles. <clears throat> so on physical exam, um, she's tender to palpate. So TTP is a short form that we use for tender to, uh, to palpation, um, along the medial aspect of the patella. Um, and the patella is laterally deviated. Um, and she's also tender to palpation along the lateral retinaculum, which is, uh, part of the structural aspect that keeps the patella in place, um, ligamentous uh, aspect that keeps the patella in place. Uh, and that's also tender. Muscle strength wise, she has three out of five abduction of the leg uh, bilaterally. And then all else is five out of five for muscle strength in the lower extremity. Um, her deep tendon reflexes are equal. Um, and then some special tests that uh, we do in the clinic is patella grind test, which is helpful to detect if there's any um, pain in the cartilage or pain being generated from the cartilage underlying the patella. Um, Obert's test, which helps with detecting if there's any weakness in hip abductors. Um, positive theater sign, which is a uh, essentially clever name for what the physical exam is, is if the patient has pain after prolonged sitting. So if you've been having them sit in a seat uh, or on the, um, on the clinic bed uh, for let's say about 30 minutes and you ask them to get up and they have pain with that, uh, that's a positive theater sign. Or if they complain about pain 
uh, let's say after watching a movie for an hour and a half and trying to get up. Um, and then positive J sign is uh, the way that the patella moves um, and the way it shifts. It almost looks like a J uh, when they go from having their knee um, flexed to knee extended. And some negative special tests that uh, we had when we were doing it was negative Lachman's, which is an ACL test, negative anterior drawer, which is another ACL test, posterior drawer, which is a PCL test, McMurray's, which helps uh, test the integrity of the menisci, um, and valgus and varus stress tests, which uh, test the integrity of the LCL and MCL. So on the differential diagnosis, um, the leading diagnosis would be patellofemoral pain syndrome in this patient. Um, that's a symptom that we commonly see uh, all the time uh, for patients who have these specific complaints of having difficulty going upstairs, have difficulty getting up from a seated position or getting in or out of a seated position, um, something that's been limiting their running um, and something that's not constant. So, and something that's relieved with rest. Um, the second highest thing on our differential is all, like always gonna be knee osteoarthritis. Um, you always wanna keep in mind if there's any ligamentous injury, um, if there's any meniscal injury, is there an injury to the IT band because they have difficulty with hip abduction, <clears throat> and then as well as patellar tendonitis. So this just kind of goes over with uh, what this patient has. Uh, so patient had patellofemoral pain syndrome, goes over some of the etiologies. And this, is to, this, this slide is more so to demonstrate how intricate a different, or how intricate a diagnosis can be and how many different uh, points of treatment there, there are for something as simple as um, this one diagnosis. So <clears throat> this can originate for someone who has weakness in the quadriceps, weakness in the medial quadriceps, which is more, more or less, you'll hear them say that patients have a weak vastus uh, medialis muscle. Um, they can have a tight iliotibial band, which can be pulling against the retinaculum, which causes the um, patella to deviate. Um, you can have tight hamstring muscles and you can have weakness uh, of the hip uh, abductors and external rotators. And so if you guys can think of the patella, uh, it's typically in a groove uh, where it just is able to glide smoothly. And when it tracks either medial or lateral, that cartilage underneath is gonna scrape against like the hill, almost like a hill surface, uh, which would be part of the bony surface of your femur. And when it rubs against that, it's disrupting the cartilage and it's gonna cause inflammation and it's gonna cause uh, bone on bone pain, essentially. <clears throat> so of course the first uh, line of treatment is conservative. You're going to try rest, ice, NSAIDs, um, and you're going to try physical therapy to help them kind of stabilize those muscles, help improve some of those weaker muscles that we described, and fix any biomechanical disturbances that we're able to detect, whether it be due to an abnormal running, abnormal gait, um, is their hips shifted uh, in terms of height, do they have a leg length discrepancy, um, these are all things that we're looking for. Now, when that patient, for example, in this patient's case, uh, fails um, physical therapy and conservative measures, then we're able to go in and do some more invasive procedures, uh, such as the injection therapies that we were talking about earlier. And so you can always do steroid, um, which is one of the front uh, first line uh, treatments that uh, we will offer a patient to see if it gives them relief. If the steroid does give them relief, then um, sometimes after that, we won't continue, which previously in history of, of uh, medical management, um, you know, patients will get repetitive steroid injections and at a certain extent, um, steroid is, um, uh, chondrotoxic. So it's, it's going to be toxic to cartilage. So enough of steroid is actually going to degenerate, um, cartilage and enough of, uh, steroid can actually disrupt tendon, uh, infrastructure as well. So too much steroid is a bad thing. Um, and of course it has a lot of systemic effects too, um, which you guys have all probably learned in med school. But um, that's when nowadays the way that we're trained to think about it is if steroid did give them relief, then the next time around, if the pain comes back, then we'll, we'll be more uh, likely to go towards something like PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, um, or prolotherapy, um, which is dextrose. And so both of those um, have been studied to be a part of the regenerative medicine um, aspect of treating a patient. And so it not only gives pain relief, but it also helps... Um, attract growth factors to the area and help heal the area. So that was a simple outpatient case that I just wanted to go over with you guys and kind of the way that we think about things and kind of how we typically go through 
a patient that would come to us. Um, I just want to take some time, uh, tell you guys a little bit about my journey um, and how I kind of got here. Um, hopefully I can serve as an inspiration to some of you guys because my journey here wasn't the easiest. Um, I did not have any um, family members who were doctors. I did not have any uh, relatives who were doctors. I did not have any grandparents who were physicians. I was the first physician in my family. Um, I was born in India. I came here, uh, had to learn the language. Um, I had to come to a country where I didn't have any friends. Um, <laughs> I had to leave all my cousins behind. And so growing up in this country, I fell in love with the things that I could, which were sports, education, family. And, uh, you know, I was blessed to have amazing friends who were very motivating. And as I continued on, um, I've always loved the idea of helping a uh, patient. Um, didn't know exactly how I wanted to help them at the time, but I always knew I wanted to. Um, and so medicine was always the love for me. I always wanted to do it. And so as I was going through um, my life, uh, my father had taught me a lot of good life lessons. And one of the, the sayings that he always taught me was uh, two things to define you as a person. Your patience when you have nothing and your attitude when you have everything. And so that really stuck with me because, you know, medicine is a very, very patient field. You have to be patient to see the fruition of, of all of what you've put into. And I urge all of you guys not to be discouraged by the B that you guys get on a test or the C you guys get on a test or a low score on one of these like entrance exams or something like that, because it is not the end of the world. Um, you are a human, um, you are bound to make mistakes and there are bound to be many more mistakes that you're gonna make. Um, you have to be able to overcome it. You have to believe in yourself and you have to keep pushing because I will promise you guys there will come a day when you become a doctor and everything that you suffered through will become worth it. Um, I still remember to this day, the feeling that I had when I graduated medical school, uh, I cannot replicate the enjoyment that I had that day um, because all of your hard work finally comes to fruition. And so a lot of the things that have shaped me to be who I am today were from what I experienced earlier on in life. And so since the age of 16, I've been working. Um, I had a simple job as a shoe salesman at the local mall store called Journeys. I'm sure some of you guys have heard of it. Um, it is a very trying field. Uh, when you're in retail, people will try your patience. They will try your... Uh, you know, your ability to control your anger. Um, they will belittle you. Um, they will do a lot of different things um, that are going to shape you uh, into a better human because one, you're going to improve your communication skills, but there's also so much more good to come from learning what it's like to work in those simple jobs to get to where you're going to be at one day because you need to be able to relate to individuals in every level um, because unfortunately in medicine, you're not going to have someone who is coming from the same education background. You're not going to have someone who's coming from the same resources. So adaptability, um, relatability, the ability to perceive from another person's eyes, what they have come through, what they, what their concerns are, what do they want to gain from your medical care? What do they want to get back to? All of that is very important. And you have to understand when you're giving them, um, when you're giving them recommendations, you have to understand what resources they have, they have available to them, right? So a lot of these experiences that I've been through, I worked as a security guard for music festivals. I worked as a IT support at University of Miami. I uh, helped, uh, helped with like a cleaning service. Um, I, did, I did a whole bunch of things. Uh, and I'm very grateful for every single one of those opportunities um, because it has shaped who I am today. And it has truly blessed me with insight that I would have never had, had I not been through all of those things. Um, and so I say all this because every single one of you guys is coming from a different background and you guys all bring a different value to the medical field. Um, do not be discouraged by your failures. Do not be discouraged by um, your mistakes. 
just keep pushing because eventually you're going to get there. Um, after high school, I went to University of Miami, um, did a dual degree. So I did biology, but I also did economics because I've always had a little bit of interest in business. And so for the people who are an undergrad, this is your one opportunity to learn something other than medicine. Um, I urge you to take it. Um, it might be a little bit more work. And yes, I packed my schedule um, and it was a busy, busy, busy clinic. Uh, I mean, sorry, not clinic, but busy, busy semesters. But I urge you to do it. It's going to be your last opportunity to try to learn something outside of what you're going to be so focused on. Uh, after that, um, I went on to med school where I was blessed to have great friends uh, who motivated me. And a uh, funny story about how I got into PMNR is I had no idea what PMNR was until med school. And so uh, I always count the blessings in my life. And one of them happened to be um, a, a friend who came and asked me if I wanted to go uh, grab free pizza from a school meeting that we had at our med school. Turns out his brother was giving a talk. His brother was a PMNR doctor and I went for the free pizza, but then I ended up learning about the medical field that I ended up loving for the rest of my life. So <laughs> funny how things work out. Um, but, uh, you know, you guys are definitely being exposed to PMNR in a different way than I initially was. Uh, I went for free pizza and then found something <laughs> much better than pizza, obviously. Um, but I always tell people that like, you know, things work in mysterious ways that you cannot predict in life. Um, and you just have to take it and go sometimes. And so I fell in love with PMR that day. It was a mix between lifestyles, a mix between everything I loved about sports. It's a mix between everything I love about anatomy, MSK. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Um, and so from that day forward, I had shifted my gear and this is exactly what I wanted to do. Um, a little bit of advice that I want to give you guys about how to narrow down medical specialties uh, is you got to think about things in a couple ways. Um, one of them is, do you want to know a little bit about a lot of things or do you know, do you want to know a lot about one thing? And so that will help separate whether you want to do more of a generalized field uh, where, you know, you're exposed to a whole bunch of conditions, whether it be internal medicine, whether it be family medicine, whether it be ob whether it be um, uh, emergency medicine, you know, these fields, they're exposed to every condition under the sun. And um, you have to know a little bit about all those things. Or do you want to go into something where you know a lot, a lot about just something very particular? And so orthopedics, PM&R, neurosurgery, um, you know, those all are very specialized and you have to be okay with for, forgetting and maybe relying on other specialties when something's out of your comfort zone. So that's the first distinction that you have to make. Second distinction that you have to make is do you want surgical or non-surgical? Um, and then another thing uh, I always tell people is lifestyle is definitely important to consider. And you have to be honest with yourself when you get to the stage about what kind of lifestyle you're okay with. Are you okay with being on call? Um, do you want shift work? Do you want um, a steady schedule where you don't have weekends? You really have to kind of figure that out. And that's a person to person thing that you have to figure out with what, what you're interested in. So when you're able to look at those three aspects, you should be able to start picking out, okay, well, this field, you know, fits these boxes, this field fits these boxes. And um, I urge you guys to do that because it will definitely help clear your mind in terms of where you want to be in life. And then, of course, uh, work-life balance and love what you do. I cannot say that I've gone through a single day of residency where I've come home upset. It doesn't matter whether I'm working five hours or if I'm working, you know, 14-hour days. Every single day I come home, I'm happy with what I've done. Um, will I be tired some days? Sure. But I love, I can genuinely say that I love what I do. Um, and I urge all of you guys to try and try to find something that you can come back after a long day and still be extremely happy about it. And, you know, you know, embrace the learning that you did that day. Um, because when I have these long days, I look at it and I say, okay, well, you know, like I learned a lot today and it's just going to help me become a excellent provider for the future. So I really urge you guys to try to find something that you really love what you do. Um, and work-life balance is always important regardless of what specialty you go into 
please make sure you have time for your mental health. Um, residency is wearing, <laughs> it definitely tires you down. Um, but make sure you make time for your loved ones. Make sure you make time to um, do something fun, even if it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day. Um, and just don't forget to enjoy every moment of the journey. I mean, I look back in medical school and I, I loved it. <laughs> I think back about the, like the fun moments in the study rooms, um, you know, the moments after the test where you like talk about the questions, all that stuff, like it all flies by. So just try to enjoy every moment that you guys have. With that, I'll, uh, I'll open it up you, to questions. You know, Sid, Sid, that's so true. I, I happen to be a single guy, 69. I've got three brothers that have a bunch of kids, but I, I kind of married medicine back over 45 years ago. And you know what? She's a jealous mistress, but I keep coming back to her. <laughs> and, you know, uh, medicine's the best thing I do. I love this work. You know, yep. I just I just work three tough days in the ER at Parkland, busiest emergency department in the United States. I saw a lot of cancer this weekend. I really sick people with advanced disease. But, you know, I love the teamwork, the team interaction. I love our residents, our students, but especially if you will let yourself really love your patients, this is a great field to get into folks because you're so restored by virtually every patient you see. Some patients are exceptionally hard to love, you know, the ones that are really drunk and they're on methamphetamine and they're screaming F this and F that. <laughs> Some patients, um, uh, which I know you never see, Sid, in your work. <laughs> but uh, some patients are difficult to love, but by and large, this is a wonderful field to get into because you have a body of knowledge that if you will just let yourself open your heart, you are restored by nearly every single patient with the value of life that we, that we are able to participate in. So, Sid, uh, this is wonderful. I know we got a few few more questions you've already been going an hour and a half god we really appreciate this uh hey rohit you want to give my fire of just a handful of questions at him real quick sure uh just to start off um thank you very much for an amazing presentation a lot of the students have really appreciated your talk today a lot of students have been really motivated by you and have appreciated the advice you gave um so to start off with the questions uh what's one thing that you wish you knew uh about pmnr before you chose this specialty one thing I wish I knew. Hmm. Honestly, I think I, I wish I knew all that I had to offer. Uh, I've been pleasantly surprised to learn more and more about the things that PMR doctors are doing. Um, to be honest, I, I, I didn't know about all these. I didn't know about how much pain procedures that they were able to do. I didn't know how much neuro that we learned. I didn't know how much inpatient stroke care. <clears throat> I didn't realize how much we use Botox um, to help with spasticity. Um, there's just, so, I knew that we were goal is to maximize function and quality of life, but all of the avenues that we do it in, um, I was, you know, thoroughly impressed and very happy to, to learn about it. So, you know, I would say uh, that's definitely something that, uh, I wish I knew in the sense that it, it would have just made me even more motivated, but, um, you know, I will say from a more of a negative aspect, I wish I knew how difficult it can be, uh, to see some of the conditions that we see, um, in, in our field, um, specifically, you know, you see patients post-stroke or post, you know, gunshot injury to the head, uh, traumatic brain injuries, um, you know, it's very, very sad. It's sad to see or hear how functional they were prior to injury and um, to see them in the current state that they're in. Um, it's definitely hard, um, but it also feels the fire of trying to get them back to where they were. So give and take. You know, what, you know Sid, one thing I'm always impressed with in the emergency department is how often we're reminded that there are certain things that we really ought to do, like buckle your damn seatbelt in your car. Yeah. Because you really, really don't want to take the windshield out with your forehead because you will really, it's like when you talk about traumatic brain injury. Um, and then from, I'll give you an emergency medicine perspective. 
I didn't know how much, anat- you know, all this anatomy we take in the first year of medical school, cutting up cadavers and all that. I didn't realize how much anatomy I was going to have to hold on to, to be able to read my x-rays and to be oh, able yeah. to examine my patients that I would really have to keep restoring my knowledge of anatomy, you know, and it's one of the things that's a, that I'm interested in, uh, that I find interesting is the docs and the residents around me who really don't remember the carpal bones of the wrist or really what all the different landmarks are uh, in a knee x-ray, for example. They've kind of forgotten it because they've gotten used to the radiologist telling them what's going on, you know? Definitely, definitely, yeah. You like your anatomy? I bet you do. It sounds like you do. <laughs> yeah, so I would say we're, we're an anatomy specialist. <laughs> so uh, by the end of uh, our residency, we learn almost every muscle every nerve, all the branches. <laughs> and so, yeah, y- you eventually catch on. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a lot initially, but um, the more you clinically uh, utilize it, the more it just sticks. So. <clears throat> and, and do it over and over and over again. Yes, sir. So it's definitely repetition. Yeah. Uh, Rohit, one or two more. And we'll let this fella get, get some, get some well-deserved rest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just ask one more question then. So as a member of a larger care team, are physiatrists able to follow patients from start to finish and watch their progress? Or is it a little bit more touch and go with patients uh, bouncing between physicians of different specialties as needed? So if they're uh, admitted to our inpatient service, then we're largely taking care of the patient. Um, As I mentioned, we're almost serving almost very similar to internal medicine in the case that uh, we're doing all of their medical management. If anything um, breaches the surface of like, of, of uh, uncomfortable care for us. So specifically, like if they have uh, acute kidney disease or acute kidney injury or they're septic um, and they no longer are stable enough to stay on an inpatient rehab floor, then we'll defer to our colleagues, whether it be a nephrologist or if they're having um, congestive heart failure uh, and we need a cardiologist to come in or to take them onto the CCU floor, um, or if they become septic and they need higher level um, care, then we'll transfer them back to either medicine's floor or ICU. You know, we know exactly when to uh, shift our population over, um, but for the most part, as long as they remain stable, we're gonna see their care throughout uh, until we're able to get them at least to um, a rehab outside. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Sid, recently I uh, saw a patient and it reminds me of how you hide 20 doctors. Oh, skip, start. How do you, how, sorry. How do you hide $20 from an emergency physician? You put it in the past medical history. <laughs> I, I, yes. had a patient, I had a middle-aged patient come in with difficulty extending uh, the arms and the legs and was having real weakness. And I there's a term that we use in psychiatry and neurology for that matter, your work too, called functional, meaning is this patient putting this on? I don't know. And we we got some of the past medical history and I I examined the patient and said the patient had difficulty extending the arms and difficulty lifting the legs off the bed and was hyper reflexic. I mean, really truly hyper reflexic, just about four plus at the knees and non-reflexic at the arms. And then if I'd gotten a little more history, I'd have found that the patient had uh, lower neck pain. And if I'd gotten a little more history that the patient was an IV drug user. And Uh, of course, what this patient had, patient's uh, infection had destroyed the fifth cervical vertebra with with an epidural abscess pressing anteriorly all the way to the trachea. (laughs) <laughs> wow. and, and so patient had a uh, 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 had a uh, uh, upper motor neuron lesion down you know, reflected down low by hyperreflexia and uh, a lower motor neuron lesion in the arms. And, you know, it just goes to show that you can do a physical exam and it actually your, your exam can really reveal the findings, but you can't separate it from a good history. Exactly. I might point out I might point out that the patient went to, patient went to surgery had the fifth cervical vertebra removed and had steel put in the front and the back um, to uh, stabilize the spine. You know, just, I I was, I was humbled by that case. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, like I was mentioning uh, earlier, like 
back pain can be due to so many things, but unless you get a thorough history of what's irritating it, what, you know, what different things are like, what, what was the etiology of it? When did it start? What, you know, what things bother it, what aggravates it, what alleviates it, you know, you really have to be very meticulous in um, your history taking. And that, that's an excellent point, Dr. Fowler. And I think that should uh, be echoed to all of our future physicians, because sometimes it does get missed because people are trying to take shortcuts, but you know, Dr. Fowler nailed it on, on, you know, on the dot, you, you have to be meticulous. Um, you know, I urge all of you guys to develop a pattern on how you practice medicine, you know, you get into the routine of being very thorough um, and you won't miss anything. So if you don't know something, always ask for help, <laughs> always ask for help. So the best doctors are the ones that know what they don't know. So uh, that's, that's a great, that know what they don't know. That's it. Yeah. And no, know when to ask somebody smarter than you. I am blessed that I work in an ER where we have sev seven attending physicians on at any given time. And so somebody there will know the answer to the question <laughs> if I don't. Exactly. So, so, yeah. uh, so Sid, let's go to the next slide. And uh, uh, there we are, we're on the Q&A and then right there. So Rohit, what's all this about? So this is the quiz information. Uh, you'll have until next week at 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time to take the quiz. Uh, you have two attempts to score at least a 70% or better. And please remember to download the certificate after the assessment. Here's the QR code, which you can scan with your phone uh, to get to the quiz, or you can follow the link here. And the link will also be included in our weekly emails. So Dr. Sid, thank you so much. I want everybody to put thank you, Dr. Sid, into the chat so that uh, Dr. Sid can see the uh, hundreds of grateful folks that are there who just have thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Said this was a great program. We really appreciate it. It comes in a long lineage of, of some really fine talks posted at virtualshadowing.com. Uh, Sid, typically uh, over the, you know, we'll post your talk to the web and typically about 5,000 people will watch your talk. Each one of those will become a practitioner and in a long life in medicine, we'll see 100,000 of their own patients. 5,000 <clears> times 100,000 is a half a billion. Sid, tonight you've touched a half a billion lives, and we are so very, very grateful for what you've done. So thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, we want to thank you again for uh, taking the time to come and be with us to hear this marvelous talk tonight. Sid, we wish you all the best in your residency. <laughs> Please, for goodness sake, get some rest. Uh, and uh, Everyone will be here next week. Uh, our November talks, uh, this starts a very exciting November for us. We have a marvelous uh, psychiatrist coming up. We have a marvelous uh, family physician coming up. Both of them are on the admissions committee with me here at Southwestern. And I know these are talks that you're not going to want to miss. So on behalf of Dr. Sid, on behalf of the whole virtual shadowing team, we wanna thank you for coming this evening. We wish you a good evening and a good night. Thank you so much. Thanks, for Appreciate it. Appreciate it.